Thank you all. Roll we'll call of pension board members. And I see everybody here. No reason to have a roll call, all in attendance. If you would be so kind to look at the uh, agenda and see if there's any additions or deletions that need to be made. Yeah. Making sure that we are looking at the pension agenda. I didn't see anything again, any additions or deletions. Issues or deletions. All right. And then we'll call that approval for the agenda. We'll move to our next, and that is a review and approval of the July 2020 meeting minutes. Hopefully everybody got a chance to look at them. There wasn't anything really remarkable. Additions, deletions, or corrections to the uh, meeting minutes from July. Mm -hmm. Third time corrections or deletions to the meeting minutes from July. All right, I'll take a motion to approve the July 22 Skull Creek Fire Protection District Pension Board of Trustees regular meeting from July. And so moved. <laughs> Motion by Director Woods, seconded by Second. <laughs> by Director Baker. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we're moving right along. Old business. I will make an apology to the board. I do have Pam Feely from the SDA who is going to make a presentation on our pension. She just cannot get to it right now. With the elections coming up and with the processes that are necessary for her job, she apologized today that she will not be able to make it. So let's hope that we can get it in the first quarter's meeting for 2023. And um, I do believe it will be quite educational for everybody. Really, that's the only old business that we have. All right. Move us into new business, the second quarter 2022 allocation report. And um, Barb, are you going to present that or are you going to talk about any of the issues that? Um, just that there is a significant loss. Um, and this is just the second quarter. Right. So it's going to be even more so when the third quarter report comes out. Um, I'm not sure at this point. Um, I think what the review would be is, is just to see what funds are needed and, you know, if this is going to keep on the trend and losing money, what we need to do, you know, to still provide for the people that are receiving it. Right. I think we've all seen a, a significant debit out of our 401ks and our 457s. So we all realize what the stock market is doing. Yeah. And of course that has an effect on our pension. So uh, hopefully the allocation of our funds will be such that it will not have too much of a significant effect, but we all know that this is a stark reality of the stock market today. Um, we the, the balance still seems to be substantial regardless of the loss that we took but you're right that is something that we'll need to look at for the third quarter i i do have a contact at fppa that i'm i'm going to be talking to about this um because really they haven't reached out to us at all so my thought is i need to make contact with them and find out what we need to do what steps we need to um you know Put forward so we're we're protecting ourselves. Yeah. Any comments or questions from the board, trustees? I think it is something that we do need to keep a watchful eye on. I know we have to look at all of our investments in the long term. We don't want to look short sighted. We know that this is going to be um, these investments will pay dividends as long as we maintain a long haul. But it is something we want to ensure that. 
we are doing the proper things for our members so that that pension does stay substantial or substantial enough to be able to pay out what is needed for the actual areas. Um, any other questions regarding the second quarter allocation report? All right, that will move us to our second to the last item. Any other business that needs to be brought before the board or the trustees? Any other thoughts, ideas, or questions? I love the pension board meeting when there's not a lot to talk about. We are making record time, six minutes. Uh, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn the L3 Fire Protection Pension Board of Trustees. And second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. All right, so we'll call that board or that trustee meeting over at 6.06. .06, and then at 6.06, .06, we will call to order the Elk Creek Fire Protection District Board of Directors meeting. Um, we have accomplished the Pledge of Allegiance and we know that all board members are present. If I would ask my fellow board members to look at the agenda and see if there's a need for any additions or deletions, any additions or deletions to the agenda. Any additions or deletions to the agenda? Third time, any additions or deletions? All right, we will approve the agenda as presented and ask my board, fellow board members to review and approve or review the uh, board minutes from September 8th. I would make a motion to approve the minutes from on September 8th, 2022. Yeah. We have a motion, a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes. Okay, that moves us directly into financial matters. Our esteemed treasurer, Director Woods, you have the floor. Thank you. So the slides that we're presenting in the boards, cool. Um, are the same ones that we presented in the previous meetings. So the first thing we look at is overall year-to-date revenue. And as you can see, we have overall revenue year to date of four million eight eighty two to sixty, which is over the Linear budget projected of uh, the four million three per person. We are over budget for revenue, which is good news. Um, the biggest contributors are obviously property tax, and we will get into looking at property tax specifically in a future slide. Um, ownership taxes continue to track favorably. Interest income again favorably. Lease revenue is good, and um, ambulance billings brought up in September, which was good. So that has contributed to, to our overall revenue number. Next slide. Okay, overall expenses. Again, this is a linear budget. We'll look at specific items in the expense actuals and budget in future slides. The biggest contributor to expenses is labor. And we will look at that Three different ways when we get to those slides. So uh, contributors to the quote under budget, if you will, we're at about 56% of our overall expense budget for the year. We are 75% through the year. So in essence, that's why um, expenses are under budget. Uh, typically what we're looking at is legal services, um, are considerably under budget. Part of that is because our insurance covered most of the legal expenses for the lawsuits presented to us by the bills. Um, as we move into December, we will be looking at budget numbers and we will be allocating budget differently. Probably in December, we are not changing the bottom line. 
that's still where it's going to stay. We will just be moving budget in between. We will discuss what we did December year end. We'll discuss that in January 2023 when we have the meeting to cover year end. If anybody has any questions, you're welcome to raise your hand. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, training, we are in the process of hiring a training captain. That will happen soon. There will be an offer going out that they accepted. So the training budget, which is very small right now, um, the training actuals, which is very small right now, will <coughs> take up a bit when we hire the training, the training captain. Um, Capital expenditures in the month of September, we're looking at basically. Um, Chuck, did you have a question? Uh, no. Okay. Good. You, grant, you made a note, so I didn't. Yeah. I was being. I got the joke. <laughs> no, I just got the joke about the okay. point. Um, There'll be an item, there's an item later in the agenda about the FCBA purchase that the board will be asked to approve, and that we're going to capital expenditures, just an FYI. We have money in capital expenditures to cover what the chief is going to discuss later. Next slide. Year-to-date income, it tracks fairly similar to last year. We don't see as big of a drop in 2022 as we saw in 2023 but again the trend will continue down we don't expect it to cross over 2021 we expect to stay on budget with net income next slide property tax revenue biggest contribution to revenue overall revenue is property taxes property taxes if you look at the graph, they are pretty much right on, very just a little bit above what was budgeted. So the forecast that we put together for property taxes is, is a good one. And we expect to be at 100% of the revenue budget by the end of this year. We're currently at 99% of the budget number. So it'll be definitely 100% by the time we get to the end of the year. Next slide. We're going to look at labor, which is the biggest contributor to our expense budget. It's our biggest line item. We're gonna look at it three different ways. The first way we're gonna look at it is labor adjusted for the amounts that we bill to Inner Canyon. Just a reminder, fuel services, which is a department here is billed 100%. The Inner Canyon Prevention Services is billed at 50%. The Inner Canyon Maintenance is billed at 50%. So these numbers that you see, where you see an under budget number, we're at 1.79 million in September versus a budget of 2.028 million. So we are under budget looking at the budget numbers, which are adjusted for billings, and the actual numbers, which are adjusted for billings. Next slide. And then just move too many. Back up. Please stop. Stay. Got it. <laughs> Starting to. Um, the next way we're going to look at labor is without SERF. SERF is the monies that we spend on out of district hires. Those amounts are billed <clears throat> to the state. And the state reimburses us for that. So what you're looking at now is labor adjusted for SERF, which we will be billing to the state and are in the process of billing to the state, and also net of what is billed to Inner Canyon. So you can see that, again, you're looking at these labor numbers, we are under budget. We're at 1.57 million, 577 million, versus a budget of 1.679 million. So again, this is an annualized budget, so it, it looks at the, the ups and downs of the budget by month. Next slide. SERP. SERP is billed 100% plus to the state. The state reimburses us. We'll look at SERP reimbursement in a different slide, but 
basically we're at 496,000 in surf labor related expenses. And we're looking at a budget of 802. So we are considerably under budget for wage related surf expenses. Next slide. Has that all been done? Pardon? Has the rest of that been done? Yeah. We're going to look at that slide next, but oh. that's a good question. Thank you. Um, yes, it has been, but we'll look at that on the next slide. Next slide. What's the reimbursement status? What? Next, next one? Uh, yeah, that's great. Stop. <laughs> Got it. I say stay this time. So this is good. So this is actually, I think, what you're asking. So we have at this point billed the state for one million one hundred three seven twenty eight. Last year at this time we had billed the state seven hundred seventeen thousand six hundred forty one dollars. So we've actually billed more this this year than we billed the state last year at this time. Now, if you look, if you just hit the button one more time, please. Yeah. So at this point, we have been reimbursed for 590,000 of that 1.1 1 .1 million. We have 513,000 yet to be paid. We billed 1.103, we've been paid 590, and we have 513 left. Of that 513, about 208,000 of that is August. So at this point, we are actually very caught up with our billing and the state is doing pretty well with reimbursements. We're at a 45 day lag between the time we bill the state and the time we get reimbursed. Last month it was 42 days. So it's, it's you know, it's inched up a little bit, but we have a person that works for Barb that keeps track of this and she does a really good job. So I'm happy that we're getting reimbursed faster this year because last year at this time, we were 62 days mm -hmm. in that. So a lot better. Do they always pay 100%? They do. Um, well, let me, let me let me rephrase that. We go back and forth. That goes back and forth with the state. Last year, we got paid every dime that we build them. So I will expect this year to get paid every dime that we build them. Which is a good thing. They're a little, they, they're a little tardy sometimes, but it's okay. We do get it. We didn't get all of our billings until like March of, of this year for 2023, but I anticipate because we have someone keeping an eye on this um, that we will actually get it sooner. Good, Good question. Thank you. Um, last number, if you hit the button one more time, Chief. Last number, that is. Ex overall expenses for CERF. So that includes wages, the 496 that we just looked at. It includes um, 194,000 in the chief will go for help me out maybe, which is apparatus charges and other stuff. Equipment, yes. Uh, equipment builds out differently. Um, equipment is billed at an hourly rate that's set by the state. So equipment builds out differently than personnel. So it's a separate one item basically in our budget and also in our actuals. Um, there's about 17K in that number for fuel. So if you're looking at the numbers, we do bill them for more than our expenses because that the amount that we bill them is, as the chief said, sometimes a, a rate, in other words, a, a hourly rate for the equipment. Plus we bill for benefits and things like that. In terms of wages, correct. Every individual that goes out, they're fully burdened rate. So it's not only you know whatever the hourly rate is for an individual that goes out. It's their fully burdened rate that includes all the benefits, everything that it costs to have that individual on that incident for that hour. Then the incident also covers the backfill overtime to cover that individual. So essentially, what we're doing is we're taking those people off the books for labor. So that doesn't affect our labor. We, we have tremendous labor saving costs with that. Right. Which is, which is why one of the slides we looked at was labor without CERF and also without the adjustments for the bill. Um, next slide. Any more questions? Thank you. Any more questions? Next slide. You missed a slide. Oh, is there another one? There's one more. Oh, boy. I have to have a motion to approve the expenses for, and I'll just talk. 
you know, to hold that up. The expenses for September were three hundred and three hundred eighteen thousand eight hundred and seventy five dollars and seventy three cents. So I would like to move you to approve the expenses for September. I would uh, make a motion to approve the expenses for September. Yes, again. $318,875.73. Thank you all. Um, for well, my fellow board members know this, but the effort that uh, our treasurer director was puts into this is phenomenal. And she gets um, and she gets her information with a great deal of collaboration from Ms. Barb and Chief Aarons and, and to provide us is very insightful and um, very comprehensive and, and very educational presentation. I say it every month. I think Karen gets tired of me saying it, but I greatly appreciate the effort that you put into this. And uh, it is really giving us the, um, the, the next level of information. So thank you. Thanks. All right, Chief Ware. All right, to your report. All right. So, as summer winds down, uh, we shifted into recruiting for the 2023 Fire Academy, uh, but the Volunteer Fire Academy. We're looking at changing kind of the way we do this. Um, we're changing some of the recruiting as well as trying to increase some recruiting and retention of volunteers. You know, as everybody's seen, it's a, it's a national problem with the declining volunteers from across the country. So we're trying to look at what some successful programs are doing and trying to add that to ours. Uh, currently, a committee is kind of exploring what some other combination departments are doing and how we can apply it to our program. Oh. It's going to include increasing our EMS-only program as well as some other positions within the department. As Inner Canyon, North Fork, and Elk Creek continue to explore consolidation and what it could look like, uh, we're discovering there are a lot more opportunities for grants and collaboration with our federal partners with the United States Forest Service. And also, um, Elk Creek, we've received over $200,000 in grants for firefighter health and safety this year, which is pretty exciting. Uh, the most recent one was an SPBA grant, um, and I'll go into it in detail and new business, but uh, it's for about $155,000 for 20 new SCBA units to replace our aging fleet. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Then the other, then the other $45,000 we got was for... Uh, bunker gear. So we phase out a lot of our older bunker gear. In the last bit, this kind of came in at the last minute after this was completed, but uh, there were four new laws that went into effect in, on August 10th in Colorado that, that actually are going to affect us directly and indirectly <clears throat> um, that I kind of wanted to touch on. The first one is House Bill 1111. Um, this came out of a lot of the Marshall Fire. I think everybody remembers that uh, that pretty catastrophic fire over in Boulder um, on New Year's last year. It uh, increases the amount of property lost to wildfires that insurance providers have to cover up front from 30% of the value to 65%. The law also extends the time frame wildfire victims have to rebuild their home from 12 months to 36 months. Uh, Senate Bill 114, this is, this is an interesting one that's gonna have, this is gonna affect us. Uh, 114 allows county commissioners to designate ponds as fire suppression ponds, protecting them from being drained if they're needed for firefighting resources. This is one we weren't sure if it was going to pass or not, and I'm I'm interested in how it's going to work because there's no real standard for this. So it's going to put I I fear it's going to put fire protection districts in an awkward place because everybody's going to say every pond is for fire protection, and we have to sign off on this to the county, and then therefore the pond will be protected. Where this came out of was uh, Denver Water started looking at ponds when people had ponds from whatever the 50s, 40s, but they didn't have water rights. And so they were asking people if they either had to purchase water rights, pay evaporation taxes, or they had to basically punch the pond and drain the pond because they're impeding runoff. So a number of people got together. Um, it started up just up the road from us. We were asked to weigh in on it. I mean, it's a very complicated issue, and I'm not sure where it's going to go since there are no set standards on what's going to define a firefighting pond. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be more to come on that, um, but that that's going to that's going to have an effect on us, and I'm not sure what we're going to do with it. But we'll see. To be determined. 
Uh, the next one, um, House Bill 1132 requires all controlled burns on private property to re be reported to local fire departments. We kind of already have that within the county. They're supposed to make notifications. Um, now that it comes into law, uh, I've already talked to Captain Yellen. What we're going to do is on the website, just have a page where people can self-report. Um, you know, everybody's already doing it. We're not that concerned about everybody notifying us. To me, it's more important for dispatch to be notified because they're going to notify us. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're talking about is probably have a self-reporting part of the website where people can just log in and it'll send alert and that, that'll be pretty easy for people doing it says control burns. That also includes pile burning, which is what the most of, most of our residents do. In the last bit is House Bill 1012. It's going to invest over $7 million on forest health and restoration efforts. That's a little nebulous. Uh, nobody really knows exactly where it's going to go. Uh, a lot of speculation is going to go to watershed protection because everybody's realizing that water is probably one of the most valuable assets we have. And we kind of have to do something with it to protect it because the... Uh, the fires not only have got the catastrophic damage on the front end, but then the runoff ends up silting out creeks and destroying fisheries, and it, it it's not very good. So I, I think the plan is they're probably going to start looking at that. We're in a tier one priority area for Denver water and everything else, so we'll probably have some more opportunity for grants, however that shakes out, but to be determined. So those are four new things. Operations. Uh, we had uh, volunteers at 135 hours of staffing at Station 1. We average three members per call. And the reason we only had three members per call is yet again, the overlapping calls. That's what always causes grief. We had 30% of the calls were overlapping. Mm -hmm. uh, so 34 calls overlap for the month. And our average response time was 745. Um, reason that was lower is we had a lot of secondary calls where people were leaving incidents and they were able to get to the next call. And we had a number of MBAs out on the highway, which is why it's, it's down about a minute and a half from normal. Uh, we ended up with 115 calls for the month, um, nothing out of the ordinary there, and yet again, transports are still dwindling. We had 28 transports for the month. Uh, training, we had some exciting things going on training. We had firefighters log 439 hours of training. The bulk of that was uh, we had eight firefighters attending an EMT class at Inner Canyon. Uh, we are participating in that class. They're hosting it, and we've sent a number of people to it. Uh, we're recruiting for the Volunteer Fire Academy. Um, th this is actually a, uh, a pretty big one. I, I think I mentioned we are working on a live burn facility at Black Canyon Fire. So what we're doing is we we put money. So I guess full circle will back up. Live fire training, Class A fire training is a critical component of training for firefighters. But during COVID, most of the burn facilities down the hill, which we usually rent, they shut down to having anybody go. So we haven't had much live burn training for the last two and a half years. Um, and it's also very costly. So we, we usually budget, I usually budget about $2,500 to $3,000 per day to go down to those facilities, facilities. We have to rent the facilities, pay the overtime for the people that work, the firefighters that work the facility just to go there and make sure that it's all cleaned up and taken care of. And uh, Chief Mulligan up at Platte Canyon, we've been talking quite a bit. We, we're, we're very good friends and they're redoing their burn building. They have a steel building, that I believe is from the late 90s. Um, it's decommissioned for a lot of burning just because steel and hot fires eventually, it, it has a service life. Mm -hmm. They're actually building a new one now out of Conaxes, mm -hmm. which is what a lot of places are doing. Conaxes are relatively easy to get and relatively inexpensive. And we started talking and they kind of hit their budget wall and we started talking to them and we are actually paying for the second story on their burn building. That actually was just under $10,000, which is ironically enough, what we budgeted for to go to the burn building. So by putting this money into it, we're actually going to be a part of it. And you guys will probably see an IGA next month for the shared cost for the rest of it. What this is going to mean is we're going to have a live fire training facility that we can go to pretty much whenever we want, uh, which down the road is going to save us about $3,000 a trip. And other than the financial saving, it's going to be tremendous for our firefighters because now it's not, you know, burning once or twice a year. Hopefully the plan is we'll have quarterly trainings there and it's really going to increase the training for our firefighters. Mm -hmm. um, and one last, we, we did have a rigging for rescue, which is a technical road class. We posted it here, I believe, four or five times. We actually have 18 people in the class, which is a record for us. We had firefighters from Elk Creek, Inner Canyon, North Fork, Platte Canyon, all attend the class. It was it was a tremendous class, and we had that. 
two weeks ago, I believe. Uh, Fire Marshal Parker did eight to expect inspections for the month of September. And uh, Fire Marshal Parker has started to work in North Fork now as part of our administrative alignment that we're working on with the agencies. He's already working for Inner Canyon and a number of other places. It just made sense to, for him to start working down there. Um, everybody will see when they leave at night, we have new lighting at the station. Um, yeah, so the goal was, as if people don't know, we, we had a number of, we had uh, a number of issues here. We had somebody drill a hole in a firefighter's gas tank and drain all the fuel out of it. We had 104 gallons stolen out of our fuel tank. And a lot of that was because, you know, it's dark or our lighting hasn't been updated. And we were looking at fencing, which was rough estimates were going to be seventy or eighty thousand dollars and i don't even know how we do it we figured the quick easy way to get in here and try and secure it was getting some lighting um which is what we've done so that that's completed and it's it, it's bright hopefully it will uh keep people from drilling holes in people's gas tanks and stealing all the fuel um our new av setup obviously we got some new stuff here and last but not least our fleet manager uh he, he completed the work on our service truck um, that's part of our fleet maintenance program. Um, it's a large job for the crane, oil tank, all, all the stuff we can go out and do on-site service, which is a lot more efficient now that you're starting to work for Inner Canyon as well as North Fork. Uh, Wildland-wise, um, we'll kind of scoot through this. Um, wildfire prepared. Uh, what's pretty exciting, we actually had, uh, we had nine assessments for the month that Kelly did, and our first wildfire prepared home was awarded a certificate. Um, the homeowner received their assessment on June 7th, 22, and they completed their work by August 26th. They went after it, and they actually completed it. It's pretty exciting. Our ambassador program is doing excellent. We've got 34 ambassadors covering 30-plus planning units. And our pro the program is continuing to grow, and there's going to be, uh, I know Captain Yellen, Captain Andal trying to put together a winter training series for the ambassadors to try and expand their knowledge base. Um, Coast Law, that's doing its, um, a lot of coordination meetings and trying to put that together. The Furworm Project in Glen Elk, they've completed the fuel break around the neighborhood, and now they're starting to do this dispensable space around the properties. The big thing is the fuel's crew. Uh, chipping is complete. They have completed. These numbers are about a week and a half old. I believe they're at 443, 444, but they have done everybody that signed up. And we don't have the final number. But yet again, these are about a week old, but it was interesting because almost every house has maxed out on their piles. Every house is now doing 15 piles or five by five by five. Um, they've almost tripled the volume that they've chipped this year. Um, so as of this will be a little bit higher when they're done, but 3,241 piles chipped and 730 cubic wow. yards of chip biomass wow. emitters, um, which is tremendous if you can imagine what 730 cubic yards look like. Hmm. Uh, the, the fire module, they got back from uh, an assignment and middle of September, fire season pretty much, there was a giant weather event, there was a season ending event and they've shifted into uh, project work and they're trying to uh, wrap up all their project work. Thank you. Any questions from the board for the chief? <clears throat> chief, uh, <clears throat> can you tell us uh, about the co-swap uh, program? Um, kind of a little bit more in depth about that, where it's at, and when we can see projects come online. Yeah, sort of. Uh, Captain Yellen, Ca Captain Yellen is the uh, you know he's kind of heading it up. Right now, I think they're still working on awarding contracts. I don't know when the work is actually going to start. Um, I think they, I think several contracts have been awarded. I, I don't know when it, when there's actually going to be some of the, I guess, shovel ready projects to start some of the larger scale mitigation. I'm guessing it's probably going to be into the, you know, the next summer. year. I'm guessing spring and summer of next yeah. year is when they're really going to start doing the large scale mitigation on open space. Yeah. I mean, speculation, but that's, what I'm guessing. Okay, any other questions? I have a question. You mentioned a homeowner gets a certificate, right? Correct. Mitigating. What does that do for them? That's a good question. What we're trying to do, so the wildfire prepared program is in, in Boulder, they have the program and they are, uh, it's actually part of, it becomes part of the property when people sell their houses. That's actually a very valuable certificate in that area. 
Um, we're also, Captain Yellen is working with the Colorado Insurance Group to try and get them to recognize it. Because one, the, one of the larger problems is insurance companies, as we have most of us live up here, insurance companies are completely random and completely rogue on the way they do their mitigation standards. They don't make sense. Some want you to cut 100 feet from your property. It doesn't matter if your property is half an acre in Will the Wisp, where 100 feet crosses three property lines. That doesn't make any sense. So what we're trying to do is build this program out where insurance companies will start to recognize that. Uh, and some realtors are also, the goal is eventually where it will become a, a valuable part of this house because it meets a certain you know, specification. Um, and then the other part is, along with the process, there's an upkeep, there's a maintenance component too. One of the one of the shortcomings with so the the defensible space that say the county regulates, there's no upkeep. So if somebody builds a house, they have to do these space for the county. Forester comes out, marks it. That's the last time it ever gets done. And if there's not maintenance done, uh, especially if you're down in the far end of our district where it's a lot warmer, you have oak brush that will grow back in five six years. So, so there's a maintenance component too. So there's an expiration date on the certificate, typically, or yes, and we're we're trying we're trying to work on that. We've only issued one um, on the west slope. There are a handful of counties that have recognized it as well. So we're trying to figure out exactly what that's going to look like here. So right now, it doesn't. There's not a lot of tangible value in it, other than you know obviously the fenceable space you've created. More uh, our wildland captains Yellen and Mandel are working. Pretty regularly trying to get the county to recognize it as well as insurance groups and is that kind of yeah okay. thank you for that question all right that uh, moves us into item number eight old business we're going to start uh, with vice president director wagner and uh, director newby will provide us an update on the public outreach committee sure. Um, we are moving forward on a new website, um, and much of what we're talking about right now is just how to, what we need to include on the website, how to organize it, structure it. Um, our PIOs are doing a great job sort of getting a lot of the stuff out there and, and a framework for us. We're working with a consultant who got a grant. Um, so things are moving in, in that direction as well. There are a couple questions for the board. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we we're thinking we want to include in the in the handout I gave you is sort of a structure for that, but um, we want to provide a description of what it is we do, and that's sort of the top piece here, um, and really focuses on our role in oversight and management of budgets more than anything. Um, <clears throat> so. I know the chief looked at it and said, not a bad start, but we might want to do some continual uh, editing as we go forward. And then the other piece is really, um, Char Director Newby actually laid out some elements for the page for us and just to sort of give you a, a sense. And once we have a mock-up of the website, we'll, we'll actually be able to display this a little bit more, but you know, there's some of the important things we want to have on the, as far as the board's material and provide transparency out to the public. Um, our site would be an important piece of that um, oversight responsibilities. And one question that I would appreciate uh, sort of responses for to and thoughts about is um, some from some fire districts, fire departments have a generalized uh, Board of Directors email that people can, uh, you know, send send comments to for the board to the one one spot. Alternatively, others, you know, and we all have a Elk Creek Fire District email address is, you know, sort of a bio and various other things with us. But what would you prefer? You know, thinking about, um, you know, having one board place that then somebody would be distributing if there's an email directed to an individual board member we we distribute that out or just having all of us have our individual l3 fire on the web page somewhere. and i don't know if there's a positive or negative one thing might maybe nice is that if you're not watching your l3 fire 
Gmail, you know, like I don't know how many email addresses I have. It might be easier if somebody alerts me uh, when I when I need to pay attention. So um, that would be the the one positive, the one piece is kind of a word. I, I do have a comment on that because um, I don't want board members to get into the situation where you've got an angry citizen poking at one mm -hmm. particular board member. So that's one comment. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I have is I have actually a, an email. I'm, I'm working with a, a company that needs to do fiber web for the area that I live. And so we set up as kind of like the same, similar to what you're doing, we set up a an email address for people to send yeah. questions to, and then a person, I can see you, mm -hmm. um, takes responsibility for understanding the question and actually distributing that to the other volunteers. So my vote would be a single email to collect all of that yeah. that would be my question. On our forward facing page. On our forward yeah. facing yeah. page, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> With the assurance that we would take those emails seriously and that we would do our best to make sure that all the board members are aware of what is going on and actually answer that particular citizen. And I would suggest that we answer that person from that Community. Okay. Yep. 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 I agree with that. I don't know what everybody else thinks. Yeah. It's been I, my take on it. Yeah, I think that worked very well. And All right. So far, I haven't volunteered to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be that'll be once we so far. But once, 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 once that's out there, let's we'll figure that out. All right. Okay. So, but that's that's basically where we're at. I mean, I think we're. Um, the next steps really are to have the, the page sort of mocked out and then we'll be able to sort of respond to it and hopefully we'll get it up sometime, not that distance of future. Um, so that's my report and thank you for indulging. And if you have comments about the uh, statement of responsibilities, you know, please sort of shoot me some stuff, but I'm sure um, we'll, we'll edit. And, Get it finalized when it's actually going on. I have a comment. You were talking about one person managing it. Um, you can set it up with a general email address, but each of you would get a copy of that email. Yeah. So you don't That's have nice. to have one person. That's a good idea. Yeah. And it's nice for transparency. Yeah. For right. everybody. Yeah. That's, that's a really, I didn't realize we had that. Yeah. Option, so that's a really good idea. Then we have to have additional conversations about. Who's going to handle? It? <laughs> so, <laughs> I see what you're saying, but I, I can. I think it's. I think that's great, but it does mean that then we all have to say, "Okay, I'm going to do it, or I'm going to do it, or I'm going to do it," rather than having to try. Let's go. Play with it. Thank you very much. Yep, and I appreciate what both you and Director Newby are doing, and also. Um, Bethany and uh, Sharon, our PIO work and PIO feel like they are really putting something together that is going to be a benefit for all of us. This issue was brought forth um, with concerns not only from our citizens, but also from the board and the energy for these two gentlemen and the, our two PIOs, Sharon and, and Bethany, are really moving forward with this. And certainly the money from a grant helps. We like free money. <laughs> and this is going to go to a good cause. Um, all right. And that takes us to the Consolidation Committee report that the uh, director was and I sit on. And um, Sharon, did you, you just want to give a brief overview of it? Sure. Um, basically, we uh, published an RFP. We had responses from that RFP. From there, we've actually chosen a company to to do what we need to be done. Um, and I think part of new business is telling them. Yeah, um, I'm missing that piece of new business because I thought that motion was going to come forward. Is, is, is it going to be there? Yeah, is it not in the pack? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see it. Right. So, so we, we have a contract, we have an SOW from the company, and it actually came in 
within what we had previously said we would be allowed to spend, what help we would be allowed to spend. So we are moving forward. Um, the contract's been reviewed by legal. So what we have now is a final contract. We will hire this company to actually do the citizen survey. And from that, we will gain a lot of information. Part of what we're looking for is how do citizens feel about the consolidation and part of what this company will be telling people or be communicating, educating people on is pros and cons of consolidation. In other words, what do you get, you, the citizens, what do you get with consolidation? And there will be surveys going out. I can't remember exactly how they're going to send them out, but it's part of the SOW. So um, that's going to unfold as we keep going. And we would appreciate any comments, questions, definitely anything else to add. Yeah, Chief, do you want to add anything else? Because you've been instrumental in addition to the um, the efforts that we're putting together. Um, no, that's 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 about the bulk of it. Um, yeah, under new business, we can kind of talk about that. Um, we'll add that as a further component. Yeah, and I think originally it had been under that one. I think it got moved and never plugged in there. Yeah, but uh, no, it was actually uh, I for those who want part of it, it was a really interesting discussion because we actually there was a lot of talk between all the vendors. Um, you know, there were one or two that got thrown out nearly immediately, but there were at least three that there was quite a bit of discussion. And it was actually very healthy, but it was good. We actually evaluated everything. And, and that particular contract is going out to all the individual boards. So, you know, Canyon worked with and us in terms of approving that contract. One so of the biggest pieces, I, before we get to the new business and the motion, I believe we set aside a specific amount of money to dedicate towards this. And through the RFP process, we were able to not only evaluate a number of companies that are doing exactly the same thing in other fire department districts across the United States and for other governmental entities as well, but we were able to find someone that we had trust and credibility, or we had trust in that has credibility in their efforts for under what we had approved here in this board. So I believe it was a $30,000 a line item that we had dedicated for this and the costs are going to be below that. So we're again are doing our due diligence and trying to ensure that the citizens are receiving our best efforts and, and finding credible and appropriate effort that is going to save them money. And we actually along our lines, you know, we I did ask the board to spend up, I believe, thirty thousand. What we actually so in talking to the chief, we so the vendor came in for this first range for 21,000 and talking to the chief, we're just gonna split it three ways. That's what everybody agreed on. And so it's well under our initial. So I'm quite proud of that. All right, that takes us out of new business, old business and we'll move into new business. And we'll start with the SCBA purchase. All right, so as I said, we were awarded a health and safety grant from the state of Colorado. Um, we applied for it. We weren't sure if we were gonna get it. Uh, it was kind of, you know, the goal was us in our Canyon North Fork. We were all gonna apply for it. We figured we'd be turned down for it. And then we were gonna apply next year for the full vote for all of our SCBAs. Our fleet of SCBAs, we have 46 SCBAs total. Um, this grant was for all the writing positions. So every frontline writing position within the district which ended up being 20 SCBAs. And real quick, Chief, would yeah. you just subscribe to those that are putting oh, yes. today with an SCBA? Uh, it's a self-contained breathing apparatus, I apologize. So, you know, it's the air bottles that the firefighters wear in the back when you go into an immediately dangerous for life and health environment. Smoke, hazmat, any of that stuff. Um, our, our current models are from 2008. Uh, recommended end of life is 10 years. Um, we have extended that out to the point of where it's no longer cost effective. Every year there's a significant amount of testing that each pack has to go through to make sure it's safe. Every year we end up losing one or two. The, this last year we had a PATH device, which doesn't really matter, it's an alarm system with it. It failed on the functional test and to replace it, it was $2,700. For a unit that we might get $2,500 
on trade-in. So our, our, we're down to, I believe, 43 packs right now. And every year when we close test, we have one more fail where it's not really cost-effective to fix, which is why we started looking at these grants. Um, and so we got this grant, which was exciting. But, and now here's the rub, uh, it was only for 20 units, which is, so frontline riding positions are for the initial first new engines out of all the fire stations and the ambulances. The reason we have a larger fleet is during training, so we don't have to strip all the fire engines to go train on this. So we have a cache, and for fire academies, we, we always have extra FTBAs. And so with that 20, it, originally we were awarded the wrong brand, which wasn't great. Went back and forth through the state. They awarded us the newer brand, Scott, which is what we have. And then we learned that the <clears throat> new brand is not interoperable with the old versions. Mm -hmm. So that led us to, we can't really have two different kinds of SCBAs in service. That, that's not an ideal situation. I mean, it, it's not something that we can, you know, decide which one you're using and people shouldn't have to think about training what, you know, what pack they're using. So what I'd like to ask the board is if we can go ahead and purchase 26 SCBAs. Um, the reason I really want to do this now is Scott, the, the vendor for the SCBAs, we're not the only fire department in this boat. Most of them that were awarded SCBAs are in this boat because it only took half their fleet. And so Scott <clears throat> has decided to keep the grant price per unit, which I believe is $7,200 per unit. If we don't buy them at this, they're normally about $9,200, $9,500, depend on, depending on how they're outfitted. Next year in February, they're supposed to go up another 15%. So by purchasing them now, we're looking at a pretty significant savings. Um, the other part is we're going to be awarded the 20, and all we can do is put them in a closet so we can purchase the others. So what I'd like to ask the board is to spend up to 160000 We should be well under that so we can purchase the balance of our FCBA fleet. Um, and yet again, we've been purchasing new cylinders, so I believe it's going to be well under that. I just want to make sure that we can replace that. We do have the money in capital. Um, we have a number of places where we haven't finished it out. Um, yeah. All right, with that, I hear a motion that should be made. Um, I would entertain a motion from one of my fellow board members at the Oak Creek Fire Protection District Board of Directors approves the purchase of 26 SBAs for a cost of up to $160,000. Can I get somebody to make that motion? So moved. Seconded. All right, perfect. That's a good, great opportunity for discussion. And um, is that the said contract? Okay, Thank you. with corrected legal team. <laughs> Any board members uh, wish to comment on the motion that's before us? Mm -hmm. Speaking in favor of it, perhaps? Yeah, Seem, <clears throat> seems to me to be a, a real no brainer. Yeah, I've already read it, so okay. I don't need to Let's see if we have any, any discussion. Anything. I think it's, I agree with Chuck, I mean, yeah. Director Newby, that it's a seems to be the smartest way to go. Make okay. sure we have safety. Around. And I would agree. I, mean, I can't even imagine you know, having a bunch of them sitting in a closet and not being able to use them. <laughs> Just I can't either. <laughs> All right, perfect. We have a motion before us made by Director Newby, seconded by um, Director Woods for the Elk Creek Fire Protection District Board of Directors to approve the, the sale of, approve the purchase of 26 SBAs for a cost of up to $160,000. All in favor? Aye. 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 That makes it unanimous and that motion passes. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, that moves us to our second item under new business, and that's the draft budget. Chief Barb or uh, is Chief is Chief Ernson, anybody want to? Um, I can I can touch on it. Okay. Um, so you know, as for state law, we have to present the draft budget. It is merely a draft. Uh, it is built on preliminary numbers from the county. Uh, we are still trying to finalize numbers for insurance and a number of other things. It, there's a very high probability it'll look very different when we actually have our budget hearing in November. <clears throat> but so this is more of a 30,000 foot view of what our spending plan next year is going to look like. 
initial first pass, uh, it's going to go, our budget will go down about 70 ish thousand dollars. Um, yet again, we don't have our final numbers. We'll get our final numbers the first of December. Um, the, once we get the preliminary numbers, that's when we start building things out. Once uh, the county figures out abatements and a few other moving parts, that's when we'll get everything. Um, and that's that's kind of it. We we don't have a lot of finalized numbers where yet again it's going to look very different. Some of the programs <clears throat> we are looking at adding a fire marshal, uh, full time fire marshal. Fire marshal Parker is part time right now. He works two days a week. Uh, he does a tremendous job. But one of the things that uh, we've been trying to do is eliminate points of failure by only having one person doing all the fire marshal duties for Inner Canyon, Elk Creek. North Fork and Indian Hills, it's not it's not an ideal situation. If Fire Marshal Parker decides tomorrow, I mean, he's retired. This is his, I think, third career. He's retired from two fire departments. I think he's at almost 50 years on the job. Eventually, he's going to decide he wants to go fishing and not do this. Okay. And I've talked to him about it at length, and he he agrees that you know he wants to work, but. You know, he may decide he doesn't one day. So we need to bring somebody else in and start learning from him. He's a tremendous resource. He, I, I mean, it's almost ridiculous to say, but he knows nearly everything about it. He's been a fire marshal for, I think, 40 years. So he's, he's a tremendous asset to us. We want to bring in a full-time fire marshal that can start shadowing him over the next year to learn from him before he decides he wants to go to the beach. So that's going to be one of the changes in labor. Um, one of the, some of the other small changes, we're going to be adding uh, another um, helper for the fleet mechanic. Um, and then we'll be bringing in some of the things we budgeted for this year. So those are the big things in labor. You see some changes in that. Uh, insurance, they're already talking about insurance is going up 15 to 20%, which should be a bonus after liability insurance. Work comp is also increasing-ish right around there. Uh, and we'll be waiting on all those numbers. And, We'll see how they pan out. But like I said, 30,000 foot view. Next month, we will have a very detailed, I'll, I'll have a budget narrative explaining programs and explaining what we're looking at. And hopefully by then we should have final numbers for insurance, work comp, a lot of those, a lot of those things that, I mean, and the reality is they're fixed costs. You know, we can't not have insurance. I mean, that's just the cost of doing business. We just have to figure out how to work. Thank you for that description, Chief. Sorry, I'm doing some quick math. <laughs> I'm doing some quick math. It's probably better if you do it. <laughs> I got approval from the I'm going to say, as long as Sharon says it's right. Okay. Okay, that takes us into our third item under new business, and that's consolidation and the approve, uh, the mo uh, proposed motion. To approve the consulting agreement at a cost of uh, seven thousand and eighty-five dollars to the okay, health that's the math. Yeah, I rounded that. It's probably a good idea. <laughs> well, if that's the case, maybe we should look at maybe going to seventy-one hundred. Yeah, I think it's yeah. All right. Okay, so we've had discussions about the uh, consulting. That is going to be necessary for us to move forward on the consolidation issue. The need for us is to commit our portion of one third of the total cost of $21,250, which puts, puts us right about $7,100 rounding up. So I would entertain a motion from one of my fellow board members that the Oak Creek Fire Protection District Board of Directors approves. Uh, Cost of up to seventy one hundred dollars to uh, to provide the finances necessary for the consulting agreement for the consolidation between Elk Creek and Canyon and North Fork. Can I ask a question? Bob? Yes. Uh, well, actually, it would be after the motion is made and to approve the contract. Maybe do we have to? Should we approve the contract before we approve the cost? Um, if we approve the contract, then we are committing to this agreement, which would bind us to the financial obligation. Okay. Understand. 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 Yeah. All right. So, motion made by motion Baker. 
Second, second, by, second by Director uh, Wagner. All right, now discussion. We, we can talk about it a little bit now. So the contract has been through legal. Um, I've read the contract and I, I would make a motion for us to approve the contract and into an agreement with Turncorp Corporate Turncorp to accept the contract, to sign the contract. To okay. actually do the work that we just voted to spend money for. Okay, so you what you're saying is that we should clarify in the motion to approve the contract. Well, it gets complicated. Yes. Because yes. to do so, then we are again are bound by that. I think it's cleaner if we approve the contract with the amount of money dedicated to for Elk Creek to be able to provide or to allow to report to perform the services. Mm -hmm. Does any comment? Because maybe I'm going about this backwards. <clears throat> Can you just <clears throat> reiterate what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> so, what you, <clears throat> so we have we have two things, Director Nadu. We have a contract that actually us and Inner Canyon and North right. will be entering into. Right. Okay. And that contract is with Turncorp to do the work that is outlined in their SOW, which we are splitting three ways between the fire districts that also will be approving the program. So I don't know which comes first, the chicken or the egg in this point, but I, I think we have to approve both of them. And I don't know if we will approve them simultaneously or we approve them the cost first and then we approve the contract. I, I actually do not know the order that that has to be in. Kent, what do you think? Director <laughs> Wagner. So who who is actually are we paying and then getting reimbursed? Is that what we're doing? And that was going to be the easiest thing because that was the way they wrote that contract. Right. And so ultimately, we are signing a contract for twenty one thousand. Yeah, the contract doesn't have the amount in it. Well, you have to incorporate the SOW as part of the contract. Okay. Well, there's an addendum to the contract also. And that addendum is added. I read it. Sorry, I read it quickly. So, well, my thought is, if we agree to the contract, we agree to the financial obligation that the contract has with it. So, by in in, in putting both those parts together into the motion, we are essentially making a clean process to move forward. However, if we are paying the twenty one two five or two fifty. Then we need to re break it up to yes. 21. Yes, so, that's correct. Right. Yes. Yes. All right. So um, I would ask Director um, Baker to um, rescind her motion. Rescind it. All right. <laughs> Let's start again. Try to make it clean, just so we say parliamentarily appropriate what we want to do then. But we, since we have no motion on the table, let's confirm how we want to move forward. And I would. Appreciate any insight from the board members. Do we want to approve the contract and agreement before we approve the twenty-one two five or twenty-one thousand two hundred fifty bucks? Okay, quick question. Don't we already have money allocated in the budget for this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So then, why do we need to approve the money? I think we have to approve the SOW, which is the this is what they're going to do, and this is how much they're going to change. Okay, but I'm saying like the thirty thousand has already been approved. We're basically I thought what you're saying. You're saying the money's already there. So like we're adding additional. Yeah, the budget. I think what Director Woods is saying is that we need to approve the specific amount. And then at the same time, we need to approve the contract and do that simultaneously. So I think that. And then there was one motion. I think it was one motion. Yeah. So one motion. Right, to the contract. Yeah. 
Well, I, um, I would argue that if we approve the contract, we're approving the amount that we're being beholden to the business yeah, side right. of SOW and they're, they become combined. And the only question then would be is if we need an intergovernmental agreement after we're reimbursed, mm -hmm. so you're mm -hmm. going to reimburse by, or did we already do that? Do you think we, no, we haven't have put one of those time. together because this has been, I got it back from legal two days ago okay. and then we pushed it to the vendor and we've been pushing this forward. Um, so in the motion, we could state that we can approve those contracts with the amount of money dedicated to $21,255 with the um, assumption that, or with the, yeah, the yeah. Contingent upon. There you go. That's a better <laughs> way to say it. Contingent upon the uh, reimbursement from our neighboring. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I think that works. Yeah. 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 The contract, mm -hmm. and then we just get the I, I, you know, government agreement stacks. So. Yeah, that that'll be because it's not gonna we're not gonna be billed yet. Okay. It does put us on the hook for the twenty one, okay. but we're still under we've what been, we committed. We have been, we are we are have been collaborating essentially in every aspect of this. Yes. So All right, so control. would you like to freeze a motion or attempt to freeze a motion? Then we can... I would move to approve the contract as drafted for the um, for turn corpse to do the consulting service and yeah. open service and leave it at that. No, that is clean. Um, motion on the floor, in a second. Second. All right, we're going to be in any other discussion. I think that this is a clean way to do it, and then we can back into the reimbursement in our next board meeting with uh, yep. perhaps an idea. We can talk to yeah, of course, yeah. uh, our two chiefs, Sherlaw and um, Rogers, and Rogers, and, and figure out what's going to be the best and defer that also to our legal to see what's going to be the best way to get that done. Okay. Yeah. All right, so the motion. Made by Director Wagner, a second by Director Newby, is to approve term course consulting agreement as presented. All in favor? Aye. All right. Sorry for complicating that. And now uh, that's the reason why those were made. Let's do that. All right. 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 Okay, that takes us to our 10th item, citizens' issues. I noticed we have some new faces tonight. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we do like the interaction that we get and uh, understanding what the concerns might be from the citizens. Is there anything that anybody would like to speak of today? Yes, sir. I, I got some. Uh, He's got yes. a light presentation. Yes, sir. And if you would, if we know who you are, would you introduce yourself to the crowd? Okay, my name is Paul Olson. I'm a resident up here in the mountains. I'm also a registered civil engineer and traffic engineer. And I got involved in this whole brouhaha with, uh, over the county. New regulation for wildfire. And the specific, specific part of this that kind of rubbed me the wrong way was uh, fire access to sites. And the way the county had written it up was completely unintelligible. I, as a registered civil engineer, wouldn't sign a document under that particular regulation. And I presented that in front of the uh, planning commission here, what, two weeks ago or three weeks ago? And partly as a result, they tabled their effort on writing that regulation. And part of what I was trying to show them is that there's a better way to do this. And some of it is that I don't think that the folks at the county, because after that presentation, I sat down with uh, Nathan Seymour and Russ Klopp to talk about my approach to it. And they seem somewhat clueless to me. Um, so what I want to propose, and if Chief gets his... What would you like me to open up? 
Just take your pick. There we go. That works. Okay. And so this is the first few slides of what I presented. And what I'm suggesting is that there's turning templates. And I've got one here that you can print out. These templates have been around since 1940. And they're part of the design manual for now it's Ashto. And this concept has been around for a long time. I've used it in my 42 years in the business. And it's simple and relatively straightforward. Next slide, please. And other fire departments around the country are doing the same thing. And so what they've got is a template that shows this is the space that truck needs to make that maneuver in. And they're two scale so that you can, like I have here, print it out on an acetate sheet and put it over the plan sheet. Is it going to work or isn't it? Next slide, please. Here's another couple of them. The one on the right is the one I've used in my slides. It's, if you look at it carefully, it's a 36 foot long truck, um, but it's 9 foot 11 inches wide, which is wider than uh, you're allowed on the roadways, but it still gives you a little bit of slop. Next slide, please. And so here's how they show it um, applied, putting it over the plan and drawing on it. Next slide, please. So this is the references. This is enough. This is actually in the um, CDOT design manual when they refer to this ASHTO policy. Next slide, please. So these are the two drawings that the county has in their standards currently. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear what they're supposed to apply to. They don't say, and their specs don't say either. Now, they told me that this was for turnarounds for the, the fire vehicles. And there's a note there, go ahead to the next slide, I think I've done. They've noted that you can you do this in software. Um, and there's a software called AutoTurn that will plot that on the plan sheets. And let's go on the next one. But they didn't know about it. When I met with them, they didn't mention that. They did not understand what they had in their own spec book. This is the template. Like I said, I pl plotted it on acetate. Next slide. And so I started laying it over some aerial photos. The red line there is 40 foot. It's all the scale. And so you can see that the kind of the line, let me get my pointer out here. There's two lines here. Can you see that? Come on. My laser pointer is not working too over there. I don't think they work well in the. Uh... No, they no, they don't. Yeah. But there's a line there that's the wheel line, that's a darker line, and then there's a lighter line out beside it, which is the front corner of the vehicle. And so here's a driveway near my house. And this fire engine would not be able to make it into that driveway. Now, what you don't see is there's two posts and a gate there that are going to run over. Next slide, please. This is how their template would look over that particular driveway. Mm -hmm it probably wouldn't work too well. Next slide, please. This is my personal driveway. And I've placed that oriented the way you would approach my property. And there's no way a fire truck is gonna get up my driveway making that turn. Um, some of the delivery vehicles have high centered and had to get pulled out of there. Um, it's a legacy driveway. Um, but let's try not to repeat that. Now, as part of my um, work with the COSEC group, uh, the counties let an RFP to relook at this. This is the concept I want to push to them. And I want you to know that that's where I'm going with it, hopefully to help you out in the long run. Now, you may or may not be able to enforce it, but you know, a few times putting this on the paper and going to the county and say, that's not going to work. Uh, maybe they'll get the picture. Because I hate to see you guys go up to a driveway and not be able to get out when you need to. I hate to see you have equipment damaged in this sort of situation because someone's got to pay for it. So that was my presentation. That's my approach. Hopefully it makes sense to you. And this has been around again since 1940 and why the county has kind of ignored it is beyond me as a civil engineer.
Thank you. Mr. Olson, you made this uh, this presentation to Jeff Coe's planning commission. Correct. Sir. And so are they tabling their discussion to reevaluate next steps? I think that's exact essentially what they're doing because they have let an R RFP out for a consultant to rewrite or to write anew their wildfire uh, mm -hmm. regulations. And as a result of my input to the county, hopefully they'll put us on as uh, concerned people to monitor what's going on and provide input to them. Okay. But I'm, think, I'm thinking about you guys. I'm thinking about me as well. And I'm not sure that some of the people of the county quite understand that. Certainly relevant with the construction that we have going on. You mentioned the legacy driveways. We all understand. Anytime that there's something that came long before any of us were perhaps living up here, that it's difficult to make those changes. I know oh, yeah. the chief has spoken a number of times about concerns about driveways and his efforts to have the capability for um, his personnel to be able to make their way to homes. But this is something certainly that we will keep an eye on. Chief, do you have any comments that you wanted to make further? Yeah, to for your end, that the county has kind of tabled a lot of that's that's kind of where we hit. It's, yeah. it's I don't know what to do about it. And a lot of the fire departments, I believe you probably showed up there. Colorado is bizarre because we have Title 32 special districts in unincorporated yeah. county. It's it's unique to Colorado. We're the only, one of the only states in the nation that has that, and which basically makes the fire department toothless dog. <clears throat> you know, we're a political subdivision of the state, but we have no enforcement. Whereas a lot of times in a city, you know, the city actually has worked with the fire department. The fire department's fire marshal is actually an enforcement officer, so they can actually do that. And it's it's a, it's a challenge. So hopefully with this approach and being so visual that we can make a little bit of a change at least. And I'd like to work with you and make sure that you understand where I'm going with it when I if I if and when I do get to push it to the county again. Um, because I think we'll benefit you in the long run. Yeah, thank you. Really do. Thank you very much. That's an insightful presentation. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Wilson. Any other comments? Um, yes, sir. We'll start from my right to the left. Hi, excuse me. I'm uh, my name is John Lewis, and I'm a concerned resident of the District of Compton, Charlotte County. I'm on the full disclosure. I'm on the board of directors of Stop the Bike Park, a nonprofit organization that's trying to stop the development of the Shadow Mountain Bike Park, which I think you guys are familiar with. I'm here tonight to ask you a question. I believe that you have written a letter to the developer to stop referring to you guys as collaborating with the developer. Is that a true statement? Um, that is what would yes, be something we use some of that. We, we yeah. have, yes, we're working on that. Okay, so you have not sent the letter yet? No, we have not sent okay. a, a, a letter yet. Okay. We we are not in collaboration with that. I, I, I know that. Okay, <laughs> all right. I just, 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 <laughs> and I'm going to love you for that. <laughs> Weird. Um, but they're, they're, they have that posted everywhere. They made claims of that. Mm -hmm. And I want, from my interest, I want to see them detract of that collaboration i will get on that tomorrow okay. we will i will work with yeah. president pixley and we will we, we're trying to do it in-house without involving our legal counsel because every letter they write is a number of dollars but we we will have we i give you my word we'll handle okay. that and then when, once that happens can i get a copy of that letter is that it's public information it should be yeah it would be yeah okay so, so how do i do that how, um, you can do a probably a records request. Yeah, Is it a record request, request or a request. Uh, okay. just a request through um, our district administrator okay. for that? We'll we'll have that for you. Okay, of course, Mr. Lewis. What we wanted to do is have a, a we the chief and I talked about this. We wanted to have a face to face conversation. We wanted the chief to say, you know, what you're doing is wrong, and we would appreciate you not doing it before we got into the whole legal process. We all understand that lawyers make a little bit of money when they work. 
And well, that was our initial, meeting. and it, it is a recent conversation that we have had. And uh, we understand the concerns, and we understand the passion behind this effort of um, ensuring that we are not looking as if we are tied with them, and that that is something. So, yeah, thank we'll you. Yeah, you know, make it happen. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right, so my right to left. Did you raise your hand? No. Okay, then. Yes. Well, I, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about these two gentlemen because they may want to talk. I went to a demonstration last Saturday, and I think the chief knows there's one this Saturday coming up of a new system that's come up that these guys um, are working on and have installed in uh, a neighbor neighborhood down 285 with. Uh, Fire retardant spray for households. That I think mean, California does this a lot, uh, but actually sprays the whole house in 10 minutes. And I, I was very impressed. And I just thought I'd encourage them to come tonight, and they did. And I don't know if you guys want to say something. Yeah, well, I haven't you go ahead and, mm -hmm. and yeah, we came mostly out of curiosity. Um, but thank you. But I didn't know if there was any sort of platform to say anything. But uh, <laughs> But yes, um, Fireway Technologies is a company that, that we've started. And um, it stems from uh, us being in the irrigation business for the last 40 years mm -hmm. and doing golf courses and, and city parks and things <laughs> like that, where it, you, know, you can cover large amounts of territory in a short amount of time. And when we put um, heads on top of houses, heads on top of trees, heads in the ground and heads on top of poles and things like that. We strategically lay it out to cover every single surface of the house and any of the landscaping that the homeowner wishes to have covered. And it's, uh, we use a, a product called cold fire, which is um, something that um, the police officers have been using it for a long time to put out car fires. It's, it's one of those products you may have seen videos where people can spray it on their arm and then torch their arm and they're like, see, nothing happens. Um, but that's the product that we're putting on the house and the landscape from the outside. And uh, I would uh, reiterate, we're doing it from the outside because we're trying to save everything on the inside of the house. And, and that's really, um, that's our basis for even doing it is to try to save what's so precious to them on the inside of the home. So if you guys have ever seen a golf course sprinkler head going maybe two or three at a time, on this one house that we're showing on Saturday has 17 of them going at one time, 150 gallons a minute, 90 PSI. And we put down the product and the water in 10 minutes. And it, it it's pretty amazing. So we, we invite you guys to come. We have the address available at the end of the the time tonight, and uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, we're going to turn it on, and uh, I think you'll be impressed with it. So. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the technology has been around well over a decade. Been well, in part in the wildland, wildfire, wildland firefighting environment for a while for home protection, mm -hmm. and um, it does have it does certainly have benefits. This what is we'll, a what we'll do just because okay. this is a slippery slope to allow for perhaps vendors to market their wares. Oh, okay. This is this is not the avenue, but okay. uh, we appreciate that because it is certainly important for our, our constituents and for the citizens to know. Okay. Now, what we'll do, if it's okay with my fellow board members, is we'll allow people to address and talk to you after the meeting. Okay, I appreciate it. Um, yeah. it's, I'm also, I also live up here as well. Oh, well. I mean, Kings Valley Drive. Okay. Yeah. And again, we appreciate it, but this would not be the place for uh, individual okay. vendors to be uh, okay. marketing their words. You bet. All right. Thank you, though. Mm -hmm. um, anything? I see you took your mask off. Uh, I know we're ready for you. Mm -hmm. oh. um, Neil Whitehead here. Um, regarding the uh, consolidation survey with the yes, uh, consulting company is going to disseminate and Who's going to write the questions that we're going to disseminate? And have they already been written? Well, that's a great question because during the consolidation, we've been uh, working with the vendor 
that is uh, already has experience, as I spoke in earlier, that has these processes already in place, and we can look at what they've done. They have an awareness. They have, uh, I think, PhDs, and they have a myriad of data-driven analysts that determine what types of questions are needed, how those questions are going to be phrased, and um, being able to provide those questions and encapsulate that data so that it, it's understandable. It's, are your concerns that they, or do you have concerns, Mr. Whitehead? You, were you trying to tell me that they know how to ask the questions to give the answers they want? No, I'm telling you that they know how to ask the questions so that they, they wouldn't be sued. Well, I guess I have another question. Yes, sir. Regarding the, uh, which would fall under pros and cons of the consolidation process, are you all thinking about a five or a seven person board and more specifically, uh, within the combined consolidated district, will, um, district, will there be uh, subdivisions or I think they call them wards where there will be representatives of the board that would represent certain areas? Right now, you just have to be a member of the live in the district and they could all be living right next to each other on a cul-de-sac and on subdivision if things were going and i would think with the consolidation process of three districts that somehow people would like to see a shuffle that wouldn't be everybody would come from north fork and is going to have the board all from the previous north fork district so are you contemplating subdividing the uh, consolidate proposed consolidation into uh, districts, and if so, must they be equal in population? Um, I know that has to be in the federal sense, but I'm not sure uh, under the special district laws if the wards or subdistricts have to be equal in population. Well, uh, Neil, I appreciate that question. That would be a pro and con in terms of right. Um, so I there, in my opinion. Yes, sir. So I'll uh, represent well, general question of representation or dimension of, of your representation with consolidation. Yes, sir. Then that would be a concern, certainly. Um, I'll start to answer your question and then I'm going to defer it to Chief Ware. But what we want to find out is this even necessary for us to move forward? Is there the interest? Do we have the support from the community? Do we not have the support? The consolidation effort is not going to happen if we do not get the support of the community and have the understanding of what the benefits of that consolidation are. So we don't know what we're going to do next because we don't know what the first answers are. So Chief, would you like, could you elaborate a little bit further on that? So, so to your end, that, that's been brought up a lot and everybody's concerned. Nobody wants representation from only one area, one neighborhood. It'd be no different here if all of our board members came from, you know, my neighborhood on Shadow Mountain. You know, so so the whole, the, the idea, and we don't know what this is going to look like. That's going to be a lot of what legal is going to tell us. If we do have that seven person, five person, I, I don't know what I'm not as a lawyer. Um, but the, the goal is to have that representation from all across the district. So it's going to be a fair representation of everybody within the district. You know, and if that's dividing it out into divisions or wards, if you said, you know, if it's going to be a seven person board, it'll be two people from this area, from this area, and from this area. So every every area will be represented on the board. That's the only fair way to do it. And that's also by way dividing it out, there's no way that anybody can kind of, I guess, load the board, if you will. We, we found that in some of the uh, research we've done where if you don't divide things out, that's exactly what it is. You get a bunch of people from one area who want to push the board in their direction. So I think it's critically important to have that dispersed across the area. Yeah, so the simplest way to say it is we, we understand what the secondary pieces will be, 
but we have to figure out what the first piece is going to be. Well, I have another question then, sort of making in the pieces. In the last um, 2019 no levy increase, we had 33% vote no in the Oak Creek Fire Protection District for a no levy increase. So you would expect, at least I would expect that if you how do you how does the design of the questionnaire get adjusted so that those 33% that voted no of no levy increase would be included within a survey? Do we are not overweighted or underweighted be included within the survey? And since we can't identify those people, uh, we how would feel that 33 percent of the People that are going to be, in some way, they think there's any, going to be any tax increases associated with this, going to vote say no, we don't want it. So, in the design of the survey, how do you do that? And now, well, I, and, I, I, I know, but I'm just saying, there's 33 percent people that, are, if they get a whiff of any tax increase, are not going to want to be consolidated. And in your survey. Maybe you'll reflect that, and um, will the survey actually tease that out or not? I would have to believe that the experience level of TurnCore and what they have provided to this point will give legitimate questions that would ensure that we're not biased, that we're not trying to skew. The, the the questions are being presented in such a way that we can get factual information to make a decision, is consolidation going to be appropriate? And I am one who appreciates the effort that you went to for that mill levy and helping get that passed. And I know your passion surrounding what this fire protection district does and the things that Elk Creek has done in the past. And I certainly appreciate your passion with this issue. This is This is something that we have been focused on trying to understand not only what the process is going to be for us to move forward as a board to represent those that have put us in the, behind this table, but most importantly, to ensure that we are doing the right thing for our neighboring departments as well. Because if we do this wrong on Elk Creek, then we're going to have failed. Our goal is to ensure that this is done the right way. But we have to figure out what is the next step. Is this going to be appropriate for us to move forward? Now, once we answer those questions, then we can decide on how the representation is. There have been discussions about the, the, separate, the separation between districts and neighborhoods, but we need to move forward first with the recommendations from TURCOR and the, uh, with the solid support and experience that they have to ensure that we're going to do this the right way. And then we'll start to address those other questions, Neil. But uh, they are important, and we will get there. But First things first, let's make sure that we have those, that we have the support of the community to move forward in this consolidation effort. And if not, then we're going to move a different direction. Chief, any other, any other questions, any comments from the board? Okay. No, I, I don't other than just to say that we, the members of the board are not people to design a questionnaire for the community. That is why we are hiring a company that that's what they do for a living. Just like we have people who are engineers, we have people who are <clears throat> counties, we have people who are different, that have different specialties. This particular company, their specialty is working with special districts, working with cities, working with counties to actually develop surveys, questionnaires to be able to ferret out the answers to your question. But we have to get past, we have to get to that first. We don't know if there's gonna be a consolidation. None of us do, none of, of our citizens do. But the first step is to figure out and to ascertain how the citizens feel about it. And the questions that will be answered, that will be asked are based on the experience that this company has with 
validating the questions and coming up with what is appropriate to ask people to, to find out that. It'll be factual based. It won't be subjective. It'll be definitely, do you know, and, and I haven't seen the questionnaire yet, so I'm gonna be honest with that. But the idea is that this questionnaire will solicit the information that is necessary to determine if consolidation is a go forward. We don't even know that at this point. Chief, you know? Well, I was just going to say, Neil, you have a PhD, right? Is that how much correct? Yeah. yeah. So I remember the people that under term core, they gave their bios. There's one or two PhDs, there's uh, multiple people with masters. They're, the people have the educational background to be able to ensure that we're doing it this right way. That's the reason why we're choosing journal. Oh, thank you very much. Is there anything else you would like to bring forward, Ms. Wayne? Uh, I guess I've got another question. What's the status of the uh, engine that got hooked in that it's uh see more fun. Uh there were a shortage of gauges, so all so there were there's still parts shortages, and I don't know why between COVID or the I don't even know why. Um they were still waiting on a light bar as well as the foam probe control for so on the pump panel where the engineer sits to control all the water, all the gauges melted on that as well as the controls. One of the things on that is a foam proportioner. So when we use firefighting foam, that melted. There are a couple of those pieces that they have not been able to get. So all the body damage has been fixed, the paint has been fixed, but they're waiting on three or four things. Um, and engine now just before? Correct, it's been out since February. And does it have a, have a number now? Does it have a number like four? No. 92. No, it's it's not. Because the, 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 our numbering system is based on the station that it's assigned to. And so when you take something out of that station, it doesn't necessarily have a number. We refer to it by the last four of the VIN numbers. Um, Adam Hojanowski, our fleet manager, was just talking to him last week, trying to express our uh, displeasure in the timeline. But as they said, so from the Marshall Fire, I believe there were 35 apparatus in the same boat. And the company, there's only one or two in the front range that does this kind of work. They have a whole sea of fire engines sitting out there that were melted at the Marshall Fire. And <coughs> there are no parts available. And unfortunately, that's just where we're at. Uh, we're, we're kind of in a pickle. We even asked if we could just get it back without the light bar and buy a light bar. But we can't even find one that would fit. So that's unfortunately the answer on that. And you can build like some kind of shield that would, you could shield all these things when you got in a desperate situation. Or a covering, but we'll just put the covering down and, and try to protect our engine. It would be good. That that would definitely be an option. I think if there were some codes and standards for driveways and parking areas, we could have avoided all that on the front end. Um, yeah, no, I, I can completely appreciate that. Um, actually, on our newer engine, it is in a compartment, which would have avoided a lot of that. Um, unfortunately, this engine is dated. And they didn't have that. Everything's out there. Okay, I guess I'm done talking. Question. Yeah, I, I have a question for you. Did we? I'm pretty close to answering your questions. I doubt if we answered them perfectly, but did we come pretty close? Did was what we said help? I guess my way of thinking the the fire the joint fire chiefs would just say we believe it's in the best interest of the public to consolidate and here are the reasons why and I presume that some type of frenzy. And I also want to mention that the frenzy they all three still in existence and we've spent about $300 in there, and I tried to give away to the 
membership association and say, well, we're scared of taking those fruit from the deep nonprofit scared. Get rid of class and keeping the filings up once a year. So the Center of Oak is already is ready to take on the challenge if you say we charters or what do you want to call it to move forward with any ballot request of the board. And as you know what, Chief, I think that's a that's purpose great right. opportunity I guess for us as we move forward. Yeah. And the question the would be if you approve this, then what is the mechanism mm -hmm. to go to the voters? Mm -hmm. I think that a two prong approach like that, because the way that the contract is written is there's going to be additional information provided and um, education provided to the citizens, incorporating our friends. That would certainly be a benefit for us to help us ensure that our community is getting the right information. I mean, for us, you know, we do believe in this, but we're not going to go to the voters unless we know, you know, well, we didn't know you could pass a mill every increase either. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> so we, Correct. We said we need it. The chief said we need it. And the board says we need it. Correct. And then it was up to the citizens group to convince mm -hmm. other citizens to pass it. And this is, this is such a big thing that, that we're very... Twice in 2013 and 2019. And it's, it's, it's extremely exciting, especially with our track record prior to that. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just going to be what what this company comes up with, with what the what, what it looks like out there. Because a lot of it, the other part that they brought up, it, and this is a really interesting thing, a lot of, I mean, I see a lot of faces that I've seen before here. Everybody here knows who their fire department is. There are a lot of people who don't even know. I have people in my neighborhood that don't even know who their fire department is. They have no idea that it's a combination fire department. Uh, we have some people that just moved there from San Francisco. And they couldn't believe that it very well could take 15, 20 minutes for an ambulance to get to their house. They were floored. So a lot of it's going to be kind of that to see what what people think, what they know about our fire protection district. And then from there, we're going to move forward with all that. And the chiefs will get together. And if all of that is favorable and it looks like we should do this, which I believe we should, we'll move forward. And hopefully the friends organizations will help us and we'll see where it goes. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. Again, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate everybody here, especially some of the new faces today. Um, Alec, nice to see you. I'm not really new. <laughs> <laughs> every, every day, it's less <laughs> no, It's nice to see you. Um, anything else from the community? All right. Thank you very much. We've had a, a lively discussion and um, some great information provided today. I'll call for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Motion adjourned at 743.